Welcome to another episode of the Gap Down Backer podcast. Um, today, we have a uh, special guest with us all the way from the uh, University of Hawaii. Uh, we have Coach Brennan Marion, uh, who's the wide receiver coach at the University of Hawaii and uh, the originator of the Go-Go offense. Coach, how you doing? Good. How about you, brother? Appreciate I'm, you having me on, man. No problem, Coach. I appreciate you coming on. I appreciate you taking time out of your uh, busy schedule. I, I know it's interesting time with recruiting and um, – kind of prepping for whatever your spring's football is going to look like. And um, like I said, I'm just appreciative of you coming on. It's it's always good when I can get some good quality coaches on who want to talk some ball with me. Um, I, I, first thing I kind of want to get into, because I have a whole list of stuff here, is, is obviously um, you were probably most well-known for your the offense you originated – and that you used at Howard and William Mary and um, when you were a high school coach. Um, but before I get to that, I, I kind of want to ask kind of how you got to that offense. And because obviously you play ball uh, at Tulsa and um, have, have a lot of experiences on who you've worked for. How did you get to that point of this is the type of offense we want to run? We want to use a lot of unique formations. We want to run some wide zone and dive option and to have some shot plays and kind of really, I, I, I was re-listening to some of your stuff earlier and you were mentioning kind of like three plays in one at times, if not four. How did you get to that point? I think it's just mastery. I mean, you want to find a way to uh, have your own, you know, your own deal as far as what you're calling, why you're calling it. The, the who, the what, the how. You want to have complete mastery of what you're doing and uh, being able to stack, you know, success and do different things with, you know, what, what, what you had. So, you know, I played for a lot of great offensive minds and, you know, I've been in the NFL, the CFL, JV, varsity, you know, been a lot around, you know, been in football since I was five years old. So seen a lot of different things, been a lot, around a lot of great coaches. But, you know, when you're, either copying a playbook or you're a player playing in a system, you really don't know all the intricacies to it. Um, you know, especially at the receiver position, I feel like, you know, you might know the pass game really well, but you don't know the blocking schemes and different things like that. So um, I really just wanted to dive into something that was my own and that I could continue to master and craft, and, you know, just continue to figure out how I'm going to, to master something, to give it to the kids and make it be truly unique and make them feel like we were only cutting the edge and doing something different, you know, and at the same time, you know, in football, there's no one who's really created their, you know, no one's like the, the master all creator of all, you know, there's all types of things that have already been done and accomplished. I just kept looking back through football over time and I wanted to see what stood the test of the time and the team formation, you know, and, and that thing really just just stood out to me. And two back offense, you know, all the great coaches that I had seen that had a lot of success and offensively had, had been in kind of that style that won championships and, you know, with the option stuff. So I just want to kind of put it all together and, you know, and, and create mastery at the same time, create something that was fun and unique for, for our guys. Uh, unique's probably an understatement. Like, I mean, you, you mentioned you're two back, but I mean, you put your backs about everywhere known to man and kind of some unique formations. And that's, I mean, why did you, especially like I watched, I think some clips earlier and I mean, you're pretty much overloading five guys to a side. What was the, I, was it just because you wanted to try to out scheme somebody? Is it, um, kind of something unique that forces somebody to do something they're not normally doing. What was kind of, okay, this is how, why we're going to attack it. Why was that kind of, Oh, okay. I can figure this out. I can master this. Why, why did you go that direction instead of say, where a lot of, especially, I mean, former receivers end up going two by two spread three by one and running a lot of that, those simple spread concepts. I know you work coach uh, play for Mazan and that had some probably factor into it, but what else? Uh, for me, I mean, I was a thousand yard receiver, you know, as a player and all the times that I, that, that I was a thousand yard receiver, we had a thousand yard rush, you know, so I thought it was very in, important that you don't give up that, 
that running element. You know, those teams that I was a down there receiver on, we won a lot of games. You know, when you're talking about getting to the championship game, winning in November, playing for a long time, you know, you have to be able to run the football. Um, so, you know, just abandoning the run and just throwing the ball every play, yeah, that's fun and it's, it's easy, but I don't think that's really, you know, the end-all be-all for me. I wanted to be a guy who was really about the run game. Um, so that was kind of where the two back stuff came, came from. But I also didn't want to lose any juice in the past game. You got to have a lot of juice in your past game. You know, you got to be multiple. You know, um, we do a lot of different things in the past game as well. You know, people think, oh, they're just two backs, they're just that. We're, we're able to get to a lot of different things. And like you said, we create a lot of different unique pictures. And those pictures are what move defenses. You know, we're just trying to capture their eyes to do what we want to do. You know, if we can get them to move to a certain spot and leave another spot of the field vacated, then we can attack it the vacated part of the field, right? Or we can attack the weak link, trying to find a way to get our best player on the worst player. Um, and then just looking at it, I've kind of always looked at it from a defensive mentality, like how would they stop us? You know, I've always, you know, been around great defensive coaches as well. You know, I uh, worked for Mike London and, you know, Todd Grand. you know, guys that Todd Grand is known for his pressure. Mike London's known for the three, four scheme that he learned from Al Gro and Belichick and Parcells and those guys. So. You know, just seeing how they see it, you know, and, and putting it in my head, okay, how will this defense coordinator play it? And how can I get him to, to miss a line, get a guy, you know, in, in a bad spot and, and attack that spot? And and those will come some of the ways that we create the formations that we do. It's really just based off, of, okay, where will the defense be? You know, I always say when they deploy the soldiers, like when the ball is snapped, you know, where will those guys be? You know, and we're going to try to, you know, beat them to those areas so we can have big games, big plays. Now, I heard you, because because I, I, when I was listening to your granddaddy thing, and I, I kind of wrote this down kind of for today, because you mentioned, and I, I consider it similar to, like, when I was at Fairborn and we ran the wing tee, is we never knew what defense we were going to see from week to week most of the time. And you made an interesting comment, like, you kind of had the same problem at times, but your way of figuring it out was you wanted to see how they um, – run fitted a normal offense and that kind of helped you figure some stuff out how did you figure out to do that like I, that's that was in my mind i like because i've been in the wing t half my career and i was like oh crap that's that, that makes sense so how did you come to that genesis of when you're scouting somebody oh i'm gonna use how they run fit this to help figure out how to run fit these formations uh it's really kind of like you know how you have coverage indicators when you play receiver right mm-hmm and teams play cover three, they play it a lot of different ways. They try to start off in the cover four shell, and then they'll jump down in cover three, or, you know, they'll make it look like cover two, and then they'll bail back to cover three, you know, and make it look like, man, it's the same thing. You know, where are they going to be when the ball is snapped? Like, who is going to, you know, somebody's responsible for every gap, right? If you're going to be a defense coordinator or anything, it's going to gap out. It's going to be gapped out. It's going to be gap sound. So, that was the biggest thing of just looking at formations and going, okay, where are these guys going to finish at, right? And then now I know when I put these certain formations and where these guys finish at, and what do they do to these looks, you know? And when I've had, when I was an offense coordinator, I always brought a defensive guy in the room, you know, and I would tell him like, all right, how would you play this formation? Or I would take it to our defensive coordinator, um, Benson Brown that I was with, that played for the Patriots and, and Parcells and those guys, and I'd say, all right, how would you, Play these formations so i think it's you know i never really lost that mindset of the team you know and, and going through i think a lot of times coaches struggle uh, from a standpoint of being creative because they don't ask the guys around them you know the collective voice you know because i i get a picture in my head going right and, and i just put the picture out there and then just get people's thoughts on it of what we could do you know and try to use everybody's voice in the room so when we get it to the kids it's foolproof and we have full confidence in it of what we're going to do. So um, that's kind of how I've always done it. And then I heard Mike Tomlin one time when I was uh, went out to a Steelers practice. He said, where are the soldiers going to deploy at? And it just kept reminding me in my head to always stay alert of where are those guys going to be when the ball snapped. Because if you're, a, if you're a confident defense, a good defense, you're not going to just stay stagnant. You're going to move on a snap of the ball, right? They're going to move. So... You know, I always tell people when people line up the same way the whole game, we got them. We know they're scared. You know, they know, we know they fear our tempo or they fear what we're doing. They're going to line up the 
the same way, or they're very confident in their personnel. Either way, then that gives us the ability to play chess, you know, mm-hmm. and you want to stay in the same formation. You know, if you get auto checks, we talk about auto checks. If I get an unbalanced and you line up the same way and unbalanced, I'm probably going to stand unbalanced the whole game. You know, it's just, you just want to have confidence in what you're doing and get your players the ball and, you know, give them the best uh, opportunity to win a game that you play. Now, I mean, you, you mentioned your pace there, and, and, I mean, you played very fast, but how did you keep your, with how much formationally you do, how did you keep that simple for your student-athletes, both at the high school and the college level, so you could still play fast and not have mistakes? Well, great organizations, they want to have inclusion. They want to be a part of it, right? So I think that we tried to always utilize every asset that we had, every kid that was a hard worker that did exactly what he was supposed to do right the first time and was accountable and responsible and was dependable. We gave them the opportunity to play in the game. So we gave guys formation. So not necessarily personnel groupings. Not most people say, oh, it's 21, it's 20, it's 11, it's 10, and then guys run out there. We would just create a whole bunch of formations and guys knew, okay, I'm in on this formation and this is my spot. And guys would be excited about that. Everybody would be excited about a certain guy going in the game that didn't typically play. And we were able to play really fast because everybody wants to play. I mean, if they're if they're showing up every day and they're going to work and they're going through mat drills, you know, fall camp and all those things, and they're putting the effort, they want to play. So, you know, that's kind of the things that we did to, you know, include people. And, you know, that's kind of helped our offensive success because it's, you know, the mindset of everybody eats. Like, everybody's going to get an opportunity. You know, not everybody has an opportunity to be a great player, but everybody has an opportunity to be a great teammate. And, uh, you know, we always talk about how you play without the football determines how much you love your teammates. You know, and I've kind of kept that mantra everywhere I've, I've been since I was a high school point guard basketball player, you know. So that's that's really just – you know, the, the gist of it, of how we're able to line up fast and play fast and do a lot of different formations. I mean, over the, if you watched our tape, I mean, I've had defense coordinators run up to me after the game, like, man, you guys are hella prepared for it. You know, like we stayed up all night drawing all these cards. So we're going to give you a lot to look at, but it's going to be, you know, a lot of the same things, just in a different way. Okay. That's, I mean, that's, that's, I, that's very interesting coach. Just give kids certain formations and let them go. That's now kind of next to go from there, you, like like we kind of mentioned, you played receiver in college. You spent a year in the NFL. Um, what was – how was the transition from playing receiver and coaching receiver initially to coaching quarterbacks? Because when you, when you went from – to, because if I was looking at your bio correctly, um, when, you, when you were the offensive coordinator, you spent more time with the quarterbacks than you did the receivers. What was that transition of something you hadn't initially played in college to – coach that position and learning that position so you could maximize. Obviously, you're going to spend the time to learn it. I mean, that's what quality coaches do. But what was that – I don't know. What's the word I want to use? Um, Process like. Uh, For me, I took it in how does this relate to me. Uh, Everything I do, I do it with six six degrees of separation, like how close am I to this person. So, like we talked about when we got on the phone, you're from Ohio. You know, I have a – our aunt who's a lawyer in Cincinnati. I have a cousin who's a, you know, works at Youngstown State and an uncle who's an engineer who lives in Minner, you know, so I got some Ohio connections there. Somebody reached out to me to be on this podcast for you. So for me, it was quarterback. Did I play quarterback? No, I haven't played quarterback, right? But I played point guard. Point guard is the most, the ball's in your hands. You're in the leadership role, right? So I understand those things. I was a point guard, you know, from a little kid all the way up to my senior year in high school. So I understand the leadership qualities and what it takes to, to put the team on your back, right? And to distribute the ball and be all about the pass and, you know, see the floor, you know, all those things that you have to do at the quarterback position. So that's how I really coach my quarterbacks from a leadership standpoint. Now, as far as the, the playing of the position, I took myself through the drills. I actually had coaches um, in Arizona and, and coaches in Maryland take me through different drills. So if each year, what I'll do, whatever position I'm coaching, I've coached the quarterback, the running backs, the receivers, the tight ends, corners. Um, I will go through those actual drills myself, put myself through the drills, right? So I'm able to understand what does that take. Then I'll 
take those drills and make sure it makes sense. And it's, you know, and I'll, and I'll just collaborate with different people and find exactly what that quarterback needs to be successful. Um, so those are kind of the things that helped me see the position. You know, I think I've always had an understanding of the position because when I was a receiver, I understood the whole picture of the play. You know, I wasn't a receiver who just lined up at one spot. I was the receiver that lined up at all three spots. You know, I just wanted to go where I could get the ball and score a touchdown. You know, I just wanted to go somewhere where I could help the team win, you know. Um, so I think when guys are able to do that, you know, then you're able to transition more when you understand what's actually going on. You know, I was actually, the, when my quarterback didn't throw me the ball and I was open because of the coverage, I was able to tell him, and he actually respected that. And, you know, Coach Malzahn would actually be like, all right, we're going to run this play because this is the coverage Brennan said it was, and it was open. You know, like, we ran a lot of option routes. Um, and different things, me and the quarterback would check at the line and look to each other and know what to do. So um, I think that really helped me in my transition when I started coaching the position. Now, speaking of, I mean, coaches you've worked for, and you've kind of mentioned this a little bit already, and kind of you'd go to them, pick your, their brain on some things. But from a, I don't know, professional growth or a personal development standpoint, what have you taken from Coach London and Coach Graham over the past several years as you've worked for them? Um, Coach Graham is a, is a, is a big vision guy, right? He, he has big visions, big dreams, big goals, obviously going from the high school level to what he's done throughout his career. Um, you know, we're, 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 we're very similar in the way that we believe in uh, relationships and developing players, um, you know, and, and, and tough. You know, I, I tell you, Coach Graham is tough. You know, and I'm very tough. I mean, we're in two different places, but we've always agreed on on the toughness part and what it takes to be a, a tough football player. Um, from Coach London's standpoint, Coach London taught me so many things that were outside of my wheelhouse um, and really expanded me as a person, you know, just from the uh, the compassion, you know, that you can, you can still win and not be, you know, a certain way all the time. Um, just uh, he's a great leader of men, uh, the soul to the earth, one of the best people I've ever been around. You know, he's just, you know, that type of human. Um, and, and family is big. I mean, that dude has like tons of kids, you know, <laughs> kids, grandkids, everybody running around. Um, and then just the mastery of the position, you know, like he is probably the best D line coach I've ever, I mean, that dude could coach, you know, I remember Nick Saban offered him a job when we were at Howard to be the D-line coach and he stayed, you know, and, you know, that dude could coach D-line for, for the page. I mean, anywhere. I mean, he knows that position like no other. I mean, the 3-4 defense, that position, and then just the passion that both of those guys had. I mean, you can't fake it. You know, the kids will know if you're a fake. I mean, those dudes have real passion, you know, for the game and, and what it's done for them. And it's not about, like, you know, most people are in football because all the things that they can get from it, you know, but when you're around real leaders and guys who, who've made it that far and been a lot of different stops, you know, they're, they're just, they're giving to football. They're giving back to the game. You know, they're giving a lot to the game and a lot to people and helping them out and seeing a lot of people succeed, you know, so that's, that's the thing that's big for me from those guys. Okay. Now, I, and I kind of want to shift back to, to your offense a little bit and not necessarily individual plays. Um, but more kind of as you continue to develop your offense, I mean, and, and developed it while you were there. I mean, some coaches are famous for having whiteboards in their office that they constantly have new stuff drawn up and they may pick from. Some coaches draw on napkins and keep a little that in a pile. Some have like a binder that's just constantly updated with stuff. For you, when you're consistently like developing and having ideas, how do you organize and keep that? I'm a notebook guy. Okay. Um, I was blessed with the with a with a young GA, uh, Ken Merchant. He's at Buffalo now, and he was tired of all my notebooks, <laughs> and he put all the stuff on Vizio for me, you know. But I've always been a pen pen and paper guy. Um, and I mean, you could just give me anything. Like, I explain football to people with you know sugar packets at the restaurant. I mean, I just. <laughs> Kind of how my brain just, you know, I just put it together like that. You know, I can kind of just see it. It's weird. I don't know. 
it's been doing it since I was a little kid, though, since I was like five or six. Okay. So, you know, that's kind yeah, of my I, deal. Yeah. I'm not a com- I'm not a computer guy, but if I just see it once, you know, like it's the same way I learned. You know, I, I was able to learn an NFL play. You know, learn plays really fast. It's just I see it one time, I got it, you know, and it's just kind of kind of ADD like that, I guess. You know, my brain's kind of all over the place, but I can just piece it together. And if you looked at my whiteboard right now, there's a play on every single spot of it. You know, there's just plays everywhere. So, okay. but the computer thing was never, that's not really my, you know, I love okay. it for film, you know, but I, I'll write it down and then, you know, my GAs and usually will be like, oh my God, I got to get all this stuff on, a, on <laughs> Disney. But, you know, that's kind of, that's kind of how it works. There you go. Now, now, like speaking of um, the NFL playbook, like what what is that process like? Like, because I've seen, like obviously, like some like old ones float around the internet, whatever, and that's and people will talk about that. But what is that? What is it? What is that process of not only learning it but having it getting installed in a league while you were there? It's just literature. I mean, it's like true literature. It's a doctorate, you know, like. When you're a high school coach, I mean, you have a you have a an A degree, put it in <laughs> terms. You know, you have a, a bachelor's degree, right? You know, when you're a college coach at a high level, you you have a master's degree. You know, but the NFL is like a doctorate in the, in the West Coast offense. It's not it's not an offense. It's a language. It's a communication. You know, it's every single detail mapped out, broke down in the process from A to Z, you know, there's nothing left out. There's nothing left to chance. Everything is spelled out for you exactly what, what it is. And I think that's just the difference. I mean, when I was a high school coach, Hey fellas, we're running this for all the play up on the board. Boom. We got on the field and running. Now that's still the same play as what you might run in the West coast offense. I just didn't have a, uh, a three page booklet, <laughs> you, you know, where it's, it's still the same exact play, but I was just able to, you know, and I think that's where, where, where coaching is really changing now before it was, you know, in, in my era, but when I played and when you played, it was just, here's this book, you learn it or you don't play. Yeah. Well, you well, know, now it's now the kids, like you have to be able to communicate with them. You have to be an elite communicator because these kids are going to challenge every person. But why yeah. did it, you know, like, but they're not going to look at anything because everything is in 20 second snippets. So, and you know, everything that they see that draws their eyes and captures them. So you have to be an elite communicator and you have to be able to speak their language and they have to be able to respect you enough to understand that even though you're reaching down you're pulling them up, you know, yeah. you're pulling them up to where you want them to be. I mean, you kind of, I like in our stuff mentioned that about how, how you, you, pretty, you are very, I don't know what's what, I'll just use the word blunt. It's probably not the right word, but oh well. Um, blunt with them and honest with them about who you are, about what your goals for them are, and what what the process is, and kind of the stuff you do with them, and other stuff you talked. Um, and, and kind of another thing, and I wrote, wrote this um, quote down because I wanted to ask you to expand on it a little bit. That kind of ties into that, and was how you play without the ball shows how much you love your teammate. Do you want to kind of explain that a little bit more? I mean, cause it ties in partly to your offense, but I think it ties into football in general. Yeah. I mean, it's just the, the biggest thing about that is kind of like my grandfather taught me uh, to who much is given much is required. You know, a lot of people think when I get the ball, I'll show you, you know, but it's, it's about hustling. It's about, it's about out there working your ass off to, to show your guys like I got your back. When they look at you, they should have confidence. Like when this dude steps on the field, you know, like you remember when you picked teams when you were a kid back when we played outside, <laughs> Yes. you know what I mean? And, yeah. you, and you'd pick those last two or three kids. I was like the captain, you know, I always got to pick first and I picked those last two or three kids. And those were just the guys that I knew that would hustle, you know, be in the right spot, do, you know, and it, they might not have had all the talent when they got the ball. You know, and it's like I told you, you can, everybody has the opportunity to be a great teammate. Not everybody's going to be a great player. Not everybody, you know, is going to go to the NFL and, you know, have all these, you know, people think that, you know, but you can always be remembered as a dude who, you know, worked his ass off, busted his ass, helped his team, did everything right, did what he needed to do, was in the right spot, knew, you know, was a smart player, a tough player, you know, like had character, you know, those things that 
that truly matter. You know, when people look at you down the road, I would, you know, the end of that thing is, is to say, you know, make sure that it, it honors your teammates long down the road, like after you play, you know, nothing's cooler than you're walking right now. And one of your teammates, you're walking with your kids. And I go, Nick, man, you're to your kids, man, he was a heck of a player, man. He, he worked his butt off that, you know, that nothing would give you more joy than that. You know, you might be happy about scoring one, one touchdown, but it's really about what you did as a teammate. You know, you know, nobody wants to be looked at as like a bad teammate, you know? So like when you're watching the film, all I have to do is just stop the film and go like, you missed that block. Like, you don't care about that guy. You ain't gonna block one. You know, I don't have to yell and scream or act a fool. I just, you know, you, you didn't do your job. You know, you didn't get it done away from when you got the ball because everybody's going to do something when they get the ball. If, you know, I'm I'm running a post and I know the post is coming to me. I'm running full speed. Now, if I'm running the post <laughs> and I'm the clear out guy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's different. I don't you know. know. So that's what, that's what that means. It's really just about the, the whole, the whole, right? The, yeah. the whole process of it. You know, what does a play, how does a play really work, right? The center has to pass the ball to the quarterback if you're in a shotgun offense first, okay? So the center has to be elite. Then he has to block. The guards, the tackles, they have to block, right? The running back has to block, right? If it's a pass play. All these things have to happen. The quarterback has to have the right drop. I mean, there's so many things that go into it. Everybody has to run the right route, be in the right spot at the right time. You know, there's a lot of different things that go into all these things. But if one guy is jogging or loafing, right? Or if the center snaps the ball into the dirt, I mean, there's so many things that can stop a play from working. And I think that when you really explain that to guys and you really break it down to them and understand that we're all, you know, we're all part of one whole, right? You know, be the best you for us to be successful. I think that the guys really get it, you know, and, and, and really start playing at an early level. And, and I, you kind of mentioned clear out routes there. I think that in, and I'm probably part the uh, victim or part of the not always great at this either. I don't think, especially high school coach in general, truly teach kids the importance of the clear out and how, why it's important to their teammates and the team. Like, I, yeah, so it, it was just like, uh, you know, we had a, when I was a high school head coach, for example, right, I took over a 0 and 10 team, right, and the first thing I told them, they, you know, the first thing that's wrong when, when I've taken over all these teams that were really bad is that they didn't love each other. They didn't like each other. They weren't friends. You know, if you're part of any winning team, if you've ever been on a winning team, what's a winning culture, a winning culture of dudes that love each other and care. They're going to go out there and find a way and fight for each other and, and get it done. And that's the biggest thing. I mean, all that stuff is, it all comes down to if I really, really, you know, it's you've, you've coached high school football. Is the best, most talented team up there at the uh, at the podium every year? No, no. It's it's that team that's like, damn, them dudes don't beat themselves. They just outwork everybody. <laughs> those dudes just do everything right. You know, th- those are the guys who who win because they love each other. They they you know they they got a lot of gas about each other. You know, so that's those are that's really what's key for me. Oh, I I agree hundred percent. Cause I mean, we got teams in our region that have multiple division one prospects on their team and they, they'll lose in the um, semis or quarters because they'll have somebody out hustle. I mean, the, the other team's obviously talented. I'm not going to say the other team isn't talented, but the other team just sometimes wants it more and will out hustle and will play for each other harder. And if it's, if your talent's close or if it's a, the right day, they'll, they'll outwork them and, and win the game. I mean, that's, and, Again, that comes down to, I think, creating a culture within your football program of loving each other and, and being a family. I, I, I mean, I think family arguably is probably the most overused word in football at times, but there's also a good poignant part is if, is that what's one of our focuses as coaches is to develop that as a family. No doubt. So um, a couple more questions before we get going. And, and correct me if I'm wrong because I'm not perfect by any means. Um, your current offensive coordinator you played with in college, correct? No, we didn't get the opportunity to play. Okay. He was red shirted because he transferred from the university. Of okay. So, but you had some connection to him before you. Okay. Yes. So, what was that like of being able to come to Hawaii with somebody that you knew or had, or at least on the same team or campus, 
you may have, you may have been redshirted and you were playing, but what was that kind of being able to genesis of you two being able to come back together? Oh, well, like I said, I mean, the first thing was we had a proud relationship and we had a lot of love for each other. And outside of just when we were here, we've actually, you know, stayed in contact. Uh, I took a couple when he was on the Eagles and I was a high school head coach. I took a couple of my players up there to meet him and see him. So, you know, we've stayed in contact throughout the years. Um, the brotherhood never really, really stopped. You know, it's when you see any old high school or college teammate, yeah. it's like you see each other every day and you're hanging out, you know, so um that was that was good and just you know you want to go somewhere where you where you have connection with people and you know people and you trust them and you know you didn't have to like worry about breaking the ice or anything there okay no and like and kind of and we talked a little bit off screen what because i've always wanted to visit hawaii and i've not had the pleasure of, of the beautiful state what it in, in, in like a couple sentences what is the state of hawaii like in terms of just living there it's a it's a melting pot. It's it's beautiful. Um, the people are amazing. Um, culture, a lot of culture, and people have a lot of pride in, in Hawaii. You know, a lot of pride in, in the state. What what is what is one thing you learned? Oh, let me rephrase this. What is one thing you've learned from your time at Hawaii? It could be X and O's. It could be professional. It could be personal. That you're gonna whether you're there five, 10 years from now, or whether you're somebody else that you're going to always have with you? Um, I think the biggest thing is just learning the culture. I mean, you know, I think when you move around all these different places, like I have, it's, you know, a lot of people talk about changing the culture, but I think the first thing you have to do before you have any type of change in a culture is embrace the culture and learn the culture of where you're at. You know, you have to become one with where you are. It's not about where you're from, but where you're at. So um, just being able to learn the culture and learn the guys and, you know, the way they speak pigeon and different things, you know, <laughs> you know, it's just cool to, you know, learn some of the different intricacies about Hawaiians, you know, because obviously when you see, you don't, you don't see much, you know, when you're on in Pennsylvania, you, you know, growing up, you know, I mean, you don't really see what the culture is like, you know. And then I got, I had two last questions. No, oh, it's really like three because one of them is kind of tuned for you. One is kind of more of a scheme question, and then one is, is more of an organizational question. Uh, the first, the organizational question, Coach. Um, from a – what does a typical wide receiver meeting look like for you? And then when you were an offensive coordinator, what did a typical offensive meeting look like for you? Well, my meetings are all the uh... – dedicate from one thing we'll get their we'll get their mind right right so the first thing will be the word of the day what's the word of the day we'll give them something to reflect on get their mind off of all the things that happen throughout the day and their screen time staring at their phones all day you know just putting your phone down what's what's the what's what's the word of the day then we'll get our mindset on what what we're actually accomplishing today what's the practice plan for today and then we'll install then we'll we will talk through it we'll walk through it We'll talk through it, we'll write it down, we'll watch it, and then we'll walk through it. So, you know, there's four phases of learning that I always talk about, the visual, the writing it down, the listening, and then the actual doing, you know. And so that's those are the key things to, you know, get someone to understand and, and know what's going on. Okay. And then the, the last question I got for you, and because cause I'm always curious how other people will deal with these issues, and I'm starting to ask people more about it. Um, because it's something in Ohio, we see a lot of odd fronts. Um, like typically with a two back offense, you're going to get one, two or three back offense. You're going to get one thing. You're either going to get some sort of like four, four. And I've heard you talk about that before, but we also see a lot of like five, two, five, three, where we get like bare fronts. Um, how, be. It, yeah, that, I mean, from me. The two, yeah, the, the obvious answer is throw it deep, but is there anything run game-wise you try to do against, say, like a 5-2 that try to stay too high? Dive option. Dive option? Okay. Hands down. <laughs> there you go. All right, that, that works for me. Because I've seen, yeah. I've seen you draw a dive option. No, Powery. Powery? All right, there you go. What See, I, I, I love simple, there straight answers, one. Coach. There, there, there. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of run stuff you can do it too. No, listen, it, the mentality, you know, I'm a Pittsburgh guy. I mean, no one is stopping us from running the ball downhill. 
we're gonna we're gonna run we're gonna run the ball. I, I love hearing that from receivers, coach. <laughs> and, I, and in all honesty, I think that's a perfect way to end this pot, podcast. Is is coach encouraging everybody to run the ball as a receivers coach? So I think that's a perfect way to end. Right. Um, again, I want to thank coach uh, for coming on. Coach is a great guy. Uh, he's also a great follow on Twitter. Uh, give him a follow there. Um, if you want more, look up more of his stuff. Uh, he's got some, I think there's a couple of quick videos of his stuff on YouTube. Granddaddy's got a Q and a, I know at least one there. Um, and then didn't you just do, did, I, did you, have you done anything else this off season so far that pr- we can promote? Yeah. The, the Lauren first and goal, I okay. think they have it on coaches too, where you can get some of the, the, the clinic stuff going, going over like duo and different things that we run in the offense and stuff. So pretty okay. cool there. Well, again, also check that out. And I know I know the proceeds, at least a portion of the proceeds go to a good cause as well. Um, thank you again, Coach. And that was another episode of the Gap Down Backer Podcast. Yeah.